the use case too. So very similar conceptual, uh, but we're looking at a different day. We're looking, looking at um, updated uh, building statuses as they are being uh, collected and um, by surveyors, engineers, etc. Uh, then <coughs> collated by CIRA, um, passed on again to Crush City, and then to a fictitious insurance company for use in their assessment process. Um, so we got a, an extra a number of extra partners for that. We still got Crushed City with their um, you know, central database. Um, we've got a CIRA hosted environment um, set up by North South GIS, where the um, building status data is um, collected and updated, then submitted through the process we've seen before into um, the Crushed City environment, and then used by an insurance company um, to create uh, maps for their customers. So step one in this scenario was uh, Andy, who's a data manager at CIRA, collects his building status uh, updates from engineers, surveyors, and enters them into a uh, CIRA Silverfish database. So again, it's a proprietary, dedicated system that CIRA have chosen to use. Um, but once that's, um, once that's um, collected, implemented, you can use that and post that again through the standards-based interface into the Crush City environment. So we've actually managed to make this work in a Silverfish environment. Just a small a note uh, to that, that what we're now going to demonstrate is not a Silverfish environment because that's a secure and sensitive uh, data. We can't show that uh, in this forum. But we have uh, created a simulation of that process uh, using a, um, a web-based app. Uh, so we'll show that with some fictitious data. And Andy's going to be played by Jay again. Thanks, Marit. So like Marit said, uh, we can't show that uh, that internal viewer that Sarah's got. So what I've done is I've just put together a very quick viewer using uh, one of Esri's tools. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to carry out some, some building status maintenance in the harbour. And the reason why we're doing this in the harbour is just uh, because of the sensitivity around some of the buildings in Christchurch. Um, so you can see right here, this building um, is set off status open. Uh, I can go in here, I can change it to closed, for example, uh, that information updates. Uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to digitize a, a, a new building uh, around here, and uh, this is going to be of type unknown. Once that's been done, uh, that information um, is being saved through to NSG's environment, uh, which is powered by ArcGIS server. We now need to get that over to Christchurch City's uh, servers via WFST. We're going to follow the similar process to what we used before uh, with Skirt. Uh, in this case, we're executing a script. The script is uh, communicating to ArcGIS server and extracting that data into a GML uh, format. That GML format that uh, runs through some uh, data manipulation, a transaction is created, um, and once, once that's in place, we then push it through to the uh, Christchurch City WFST server, and that information is uh, populated in. So we should see that uh, go through very soon. Just wait for it to run through. There we go. Converting, posting. So it's just connecting to the environment right now. And it's posted it. And that ID is posted with an ID of 56. Thank you for that. So what we've seen here is the... Um, We've simulated the data entry, um, so we weren't using Silverfish as described before because that wasn't possible. But submitting the building status that, that Jay just um, digitized with the attributes and put that in. Uh, and we'll then move on to the next step. Uh, Roberta is an operation officer at uh, Correction City, accept the building status data in their staged environment, does a visual inspection, see the footprints about right, matches. Um, you know, the existing underlying area, uh, the attributes are right, and then again approves the submitted changes for um, submission. So we'll go over to Robert from Intergraph, who will demonstrate that part. Thanks, Moritz. So I'm um, back in the Christchurch City type environment here, and we're connecting up to um, our data that um, from the WFS feed in this case. Okay. And here we're seeing the, the data that's just been uploaded to Christchurch City Council um, staging database. So I can click on one of these features here 
and go through, the process will be the same as what Chris showed before of going through and setting up the approval process, but here we can see the unknown um, status and the um, 56 ID. Okay. Thanks very much. And then finally, um, so what we've done now, we've seen Roberta do what we now see as a well-known process, <coughs> looking at the staging database, identifying, yes, this footprint is right, it is in the harbour for demonstration purposes, um, but it's got the right ID, it's got the right attributes, and push it and make it available. And that brings us to the final step. Um, so we've got Eddie, who's an insurance assessor at, at InsureCorp, um, needs to get an overview of the status of buildings around and in Littleton Harbour for, uh, for a customer. So what he done does is uses his desktop GIS, which in InsureCorp happens to be MapInfoProp, um, and links in to directly to the um, feature surface, so a live link into the Christchurch City database, um, adds this information layer, the building status information layer to his map and displays that map for distribution to his customers. And that part of the process is going to be demonstrated by Chris uh, over there. So here I'm just sitting um, at an internet connection anywhere, anywhere on the internet with the desktop uh, tool Map Info Professional and we've got a little bit of background data here off of Bing Maps and I'm just going to issue a refresh statement on my building statuses. So I was connected to the data already and that data has been pushed through and updated into the WFS feed and we're just going to issue a refresh statement asking to uh, have a look at that data again. So it's very important what, uh, what Chris said there is he could be literally anywhere on the internet um, you know, using an open or secure access into the live Prussia City database and um, especially in the case of this particular data where you know, the, the turnaround and the frequency of, of updates on this data is quite high, it's important that it has that live on-demand access using open standards interfaces. Chris. And so we can see that those buildings that were passed in have appeared in the middle of the harbour and I can uh, have a look at the information and attributes behind those and we can see that it had an unknown, has an unknown status and right down the bottom here we'll have a uh, ID of 56 and so I've been able to complete the loop and I can use that in my desktop GIS tool that can read a WFS feed to do whatever I need to do, make maps, perform analysis and basically make use of it. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Um, so the last step, we saw Eddie using, again, proprietary technology that they're familiar with, their organization is familiar with, he's straight into connecting to the open interface as, as exposed through Russia City and getting live access to that billing status data um, that was just updated through Sierra. Um, so before this capability uh, was put in place, basically this billing status data did not get um, sometimes they don't get to Pressure City at all, or when they did get it was on an ad hoc basis and, and some spreadsheets. Uh, which meant there was no real overview uh, of building status um, outside of Sierra available, uh, and obviously you know that's a big decision making information layer um, that was, a, was hindering um, the recovery process. So now that we've got this, we're avoiding double handling, we're avoiding ambiguity in uh, in the spilling status information. And now that we've demonstrated that, we can get this similar process for water and wastewater assets. We can do it for um, building status information. We can start extending that to rock falls, portaloo location, temporary water supplies, you name it, etc., etc., all with limited initial investment from practices <coughs> making the WFS, WFST um, web service available, standard web service and then basically setting and forgetting that and moving on to other work. Um, so what we learned from doing this black, black first well, interoperability works. Um, we've, we've tested a number of services, a number of technologies um, and standards. WFS, the Web Feature Service uh, protocol for exchanging geographic data, is absolutely mature and easy to work with. Um, COTS, commercial off the cell, cell shelf tools for the transaction service, definitely mature, working easy. 
uh, we have to do a little bit of tinkering around the client submitting to transaction services. So that's maturing, but very close. Um, one thing we learned is that this is all very schema sensitive. What do I mean by that? Schema sensitive is that the data model of the content you're pushing across, so it's not just the footprints or the geometry, but it's actually the attributes attached to that that you're sending with the data. Uh, that <coughs> the way that's represented on the sender side and the way that's represented on the client side, or the receiver side, has to be very much synchronized and very much in sync. And it's very easy to have little subtle differences that break the process. So having a good, what's called a good community schema, an agreed format, an agreed schema for exchanging the geographic information is very is critical. But we managed to do that, and again, we managed to do that. Um, at the moment, submitting to WFST with the standard products that are available on the client side requires some script scripting, but there are plugins available, third-party plugins or <coughs> native uh, pro, um, vendor plugins that for relatively little investment can uh, make the client's WFST compliant and capable without the need for such scripting. Very important, I can't stress this enough, this is an architecture and a capability that is technology agnostic. But these are just a few of the technologies we've just managed to plug together that are have proprietary interfaces, proprietary data models that work internally, but they all have that standards compliance those open geospatial standards that allow them, allow us to plug them together in very limited time and actually get them to communicate. And that really is the big, big, big value of what we've shown here today. A number of caveats. So we've, what we've demonstrated is that we can connect these wires, we can plug them together, we can agree on the content and how we encode that content and send it across the wires. So we managed to make that work with all these different technologies. So this is a viable solution <coughs> architecture. It's not scary. It, it can work. This is not a production system. We can't go home tonight and expect Monday morning to be this up and running. There's all kinds of IT, you know, technology engineering elements that will need to be put in place. There's a workflow managing, management, notification, uh, security uh, that will need to be put in place before you can put this in a production system. But the core solution is here and we built it. So how do we get this? What do you need to do to get this to a production environment? Very important to be very precise about publishing your schemas, your content, and agreeing on that so that as more submitters come on board, they know what the, how to encode the data, how to format it, and how to do it. So there's guides, how to guides, um, to help them along that. Um, on the client side, if you don't want to do the scripting, there's a number of out-of-the-box technologies and plugins, such as CarbonArc, Gaia, there's CatCore, and then these are just a few that will, will enable you to submit directly into um, the WFST. There are other tools that are emerging in related standards, and there's one of note is <coughs> the OGC Geosynchronization Service that will actually out-of-the-box provides you not only with the WFST capability, but a whole bunch of workflow management and notification and, and, and all that out of the box so that you can actually create that right there and then, should you so desire. So there's all kinds of tools out there, engineering tools, technology tools, that can actually help you create this from a concept to production with relatively little effort. So concluding, these three days have been an absolute success. We've achieved what we set out to do, and demonstrated that viable solution architecture, not just in theory, but in practice. We've seen it, you've seen it work here today. We've achieved that in three days by putting people together in a room, encouraging them to cooperate, being sitting next to each other and being able to compare notes, remove the distractions and just get it done. It's a process that would easily have taken weeks of effort and months of time to do that in another environment and created that jump off point for getting a robust, hardened production system. And a solution that is reusable, we've demonstrated it for two themes, it can be replicated and reused for other themes. Um, with that, I thank you very much for your attention, um, and thank all the um, technologists and organizations who have worked here so hard for three days.
and, uh, and make you some success. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. And they are happy to take questions. Give yourselves a clap. So much a question, but uh, thanks to Lynn's, and I'd like to personally thank Todd for his efforts from, from a scoop perspective. I'm sure uh, you've learned a lot, and I think the whole team's probably learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure that's going to make a huge difference for us uh, in terms of the ASBIT. So, yeah, it's good. Very much echo that, Jeremy. Um, can't say how much of the job well done to all. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed myself. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of it. Yeah, well, I'll stop there. Surely there must be questions. Just, just uh, one, one from me, which is the, the client WFST. And it's really, it's really for Intergraph and Esri, you know, that you, you said there are various middleware bits there or, or third-party um, products. I'm presuming that it's on both of your roadmaps to be able to do that client WFST stuff out of the box and I mean just sort of what kind of time frames you know I'm not trying to put you on the spot but what kind of time frames you know might we be looking at for that? That's in production. It's in production. Seen today. Yeah, right. That's the WFST from okay. our client and okay. service products. So from an Esri perspective like I mentioned before it is not uh, we, we don't support uh, WFST from our desktop tools. Um, it is on the roadmap. Um, in two weeks' time, we're releasing uh, the next version of our software, 10.1, which is a major release. It's not going to be in that version, but we're looking at post 10.1 uh, in a service pack to, to bring that into uh, as a supported um, uh, service. Okay. Uh -huh. But I mean, there, your desktop tool is extensible, and there are plugins exactly. available that add that functionality right That's now. Right. Yeah, so I'm familiar with the Carbon plugin, it works quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Carbon Arc is an add-in that does do that. Uh, yeah. But normally with Esri, we'll, we, we'd wait a while um, to see the, to the standard mature, and then we add, uh, we, we'll add that functionality in. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, a fantastic and significant step forward. Um, so some, some great opportunities here. So the real-life ability now, taking it back from, from lessons learned today, taking this back into production, the reality of being able to take this into production, how much time and effort do we think is going to be required? Fingers in the air at the moment to say that we've got something that we can stand up and use between the two parties. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll talk, I'll, I guess I'll talk from a scoop perspective. I mean, from, from a scoop perspective, it's our highest priority. I mean, that's why it's been so valuable to, sure. important to have Todd here, but we've got a team working on the Airsbooks, as you know, so... Um, it'll get as, about as high attention as it possibly can from a perspective. So uh, I can only say as quick as possible. So, it'll be the so do we have any obvious stumbling blocks or something within our organisations that we're going to have to take away and, and put some significant focus to? You guys identified some of those potential barriers or areas at the moment that we're going to... Um, I, mean, I suppose from my side, we've got plenty of demands coming from other parts of council to have stuff through cool as built which which don't necessarily rely on this process. Um, so that's probably still in the block from our side. So if there'd be a policy that said actually from now on all, all as builds will have to follow this process, uh, which might be sort of an initial investment hub to go over, but you know the argument is that yeah. Once you've made that investment, it actually goes much yeah. quicker. And, and the time saving, the resource, and the yeah. effort. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. From the council's end, we need to invest a bit of time in helping to communicate the schema mm -hmm. um, for those for those various networks. And so that will involve <coughs> some meetings and some some a method of agreeing a method of communicating that um, and supporting some testing. Um, I don't think we know how we would go forward. Um, yeah. I'm feeling really quite confident. Yeah. Well, it's fair to say that's probably one of the things that's been a bit of a block, you know, in finalising that from our perspective, from a oh, perspective. Yeah, I think that Got all the changes from the asset guys, from mm -hmm, the data mm -hmm. team, so... Um, Plus we never were able to connect them right through this WFST, mm -hmm. so we never went down the path of conforming our scheme to it, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we couldn't do it. And, and we've been forced into a position where everybody is, is adapting <coughs> and building on the fly. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It's, it's a changing environment on a daily basis almost. So to be able to get to this stage now is, is a monumental you know, achievement. It's fantastic. Yeah, so something one, that, something so that a, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. We couldn't see a way forward. Mm. The, the one bit of advice from my experience in these kind of things is that the level of understanding you've built up over the, the, the last three days will degrade much as you, you don't like it very quickly because other things will interfere. If it's at all possible to cement this um, very quickly, then you're going to find that going back to it is going to be uh, um, a, lot less, uh, a lot less painful than it would be. Uh, would be otherwise. In that, in that light, I'd like to encourage everyone involved, um, when you get to work tomorrow morning, maybe the first half hour, do not look at your inbox, but go to the Lessons Learned document in Google Docs and just spend 20 minutes entering what you have learned into that document. That will be you know, synthesized and put into the, into the document deliverable that we put forward that Andy and I will create. And while that is fresh, we don't even want to do it tonight, if you like. <coughs> Poor club. Um, <laughs> they may not be able to go through the haze of beer. Or <laughs> <laughs> the alcohol hits. Uh, but otherwise, tomorrow morning, because that's absolutely true, it, it tends to degrade. And uh, if you don't do it the first first 20 minutes before you open that inbox, um, chances you're going to get it, you get it done are going to go away. The, I mean, the other learning lesson from this is that I used to work with a guy who used to reckon that the best ideas come between zero and two beers. All right? <laughs> after, after that, you're a waste of space. But there are some really fantastic ideas that appear in that space. So we've still got one more window of opportunity. <laughs> Any final questions, comments? I enjoyed myself. We did say at the beginning we may, must make sure it's fun, if anything. No, it'd be hard to come that. back any time. Um, so, so, general feed from the floor, if, if you could say what, what were the two things from your guys' perspective that made the change, what are the two most significant factors? Knowing how to insert. So, like the actual schema of the insert. Having someone that completely yeah. understands those WFST schema protocols and yeah. <laughs> I mean, step one was handwriting one. Um, yes. That's <laughs> stunningly impressive. Um, <laughs> 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 I mean, to a large extent, these things are templates almost. But the schema, once you fix it, doesn't really change, so you can almost template the inserts and just plug in the values. So that's why we took it. We took that approach. We write it by hand, make sure it works, and then replicate it over and over and over for different values. So yeah. So the way of the day is schema. That's yeah. pretty schema much and the API, the two touchstones yeah. of interoperability at OGC. Sure. All right. Well thank you again for all your input, for coming out to watch this and for your